Chapter 8, After the Flood. This chapter is based on Genesis 7, verse 20, through chapter 9, verse 17. The waters rose fifteen cubits above the highest mountains. It often seemed to the family within the ark that they must perish, as for five long months their boat was tossed about, apparently at the mercy of wind and wave. It was a trying ordeal, but Noah's faith did not waver, for he had the assurance that the divine hand was upon the helm. As the waters began to subside, the Lord caused the ark to drift into a spot protected by a group of mountains that had been preserved by his power. These mountains were but a little distance apart, and the ark moved about in this quiet haven, and was no longer driven upon the boundless ocean. This gave great relief to the weary, tempest-tossed voyagers. Noah and his family anxiously waited for the decrease of the waters, for they longed to go forth again upon the earth. Forty days after the tops of the mountains became visible, they sent out a raven, a bird of quick scent, to discover whether the earth had become dry. This bird, finding nothing but water, continued to fly to and from the ark. Seven days later a dove was sent forth, which, finding no footing, returned to the ark. Noah waited seven days longer, and again sent forth the dove. When she returned at evening with an olive leaf in her mouth, there was great rejoicing. Later, Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. Still he waited patiently within the ark. As he had entered at God's command, he waited for special directions to depart. At last an angel descended from heaven, opened the massive door, and bade the patriarch and his household go forth upon the earth and take with them every living thing. In the joy of their release, Noah did not forget him by whose gracious care they had been preserved. His first act, after leaving the ark, was to build an altar and offer from every kind of clean beast and fowl a sacrifice, thus manifesting his gratitude to God for deliverance, and his faith in Christ, the great sacrifice. This offering was pleasing to the Lord, and a blessing resulted, not only to the patriarch and his family, but to all who should live upon the earth. The Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Here was a lesson for all succeeding generations. Noah had come forth upon a desolate earth, but before preparing a house for himself, he built an altar to God. His stock of cattle was small and had been preserved at great expense. Yet he cheerfully gave a part to the Lord as an acknowledgment that all was his. In like manner it should be our first care to render our free will offerings to God. Every manifestation of His mercy and love toward us should be gratefully acknowledged, both by acts of devotion and by gifts to His cause. Lest the gathering clouds and falling rain should fill men with constant terror from fear of another flood, the Lord encouraged the family of Noah by a promise, I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature. How great the condescension of God and His compassion for His erring creatures in thus placing the beautiful rainbow in the clouds, as a token of His covenant with men. The Lord declares that when He looks upon the bow, He will remember His covenant. This does not imply that He would ever forget, but He speaks to us in our own language, that we may better understand Him. It was God's purpose that as the children of after generations should ask the meaning of the glorious arch, 
which spans the heavens. Their parents should repeat the story of the flood and tell them that the Most High had bended the bow and placed it in the clouds as an assurance that the waters should never again overflow the earth. Thus from generation to generation it would testify of divine love to man and would strengthen his confidence in God. In heaven the semblance of a rainbow encircles the throne and overarches the head of Christ. The prophet says, As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about the throne. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Jehovah. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 28. The revelator declares, Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. There was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Revelation chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. When man by his great wickedness invites the divine judgments, the Savior, interceding with the Father in his behalf, points to the bow in the clouds, to the rainbow around the throne and above his own head, as a token of the mercy of God toward the repentant sinner. With the assurance given to Noah concerning the flood, God himself has linked one of the most precious promises of his grace. As I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith Jehovah, that hath mercy on thee. Isaiah chapter 54, verses 9 and 10. As Noah looked upon the powerful beasts of prey that came forth with him from the ark, he feared that his family, numbering only eight persons, would be destroyed by them. But the Lord sent an angel to his servant with the assuring message, The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Before this time God had given man no permission to eat animal food. He intended that the race should subsist wholly upon the productions of the earth. But now that every green thing had been destroyed, he allowed them to eat the flesh of the clean beasts that had been preserved in the ark. The entire surface of the earth was changed at the flood. A third dreadful curse rested upon it in consequence of sin. As the water began to subside, the hills and mountains were surrounded by a vast, turbid sea. Everywhere were strewn the dead bodies of men and beasts. The Lord would not permit these to remain to decompose and pollute the air. Therefore, He made of the earth a vast burial ground. A violent wind, which was caused to blow for the purpose of drying up the waters, moved them with great force, in some instances, even carrying away the tops of the mountains and the heaping up of trees, rocks, and earth above the bodies of the dead. By the same means, the silver and gold, the choice wood and precious stones, which had enriched and adorned the world before the flood, and which the inhabitants had idolized, were concealed from the sight and search of men. The violent action of the waters piling earth and rocks upon these treasures, and in some cases even forming mountains above them. God saw that the more he enriched and prospered sinful men, the more they would corrupt their ways before him. The treasures that should have led them to glorify the bountiful giver had been worshipped, while God had been dishonored and despised. The earth presented an appearance of confusion and desolation impossible to describe. The mountains, once so beautiful in their perfect symmetry, had become broken and irregular. Stones, ledges, and ragged rocks were now scattered upon the surface of the earth. In many places hills and mountains had disappeared, leaving no trace where they once stood. And plains had given place to mountain ranges. These changes were more marked in some places than in others. 
where once had been earth's richest treasures of gold, silver, and precious stones, were seen the heaviest marks of the curse. And upon countries that were not inhabited, and those where there had been the least crime, the curse rested more lightly. At this time immense forests were buried. These have since been changed to coal, forming the extensive coal beds that now exist, and also yielding large quantities of oil. The coal and oil frequently ignite and burn beneath the surface of the earth. Thus rocks are heated, limestone is burned, and iron ore melted. The action of the water upon the lime adds fury to the intense heat and causes earthquakes, volcanoes, and fiery issues. As the fire and water come in contact with ledges of rock and ore, there are heavy explosions underground, which sound like muffled thunder. The air is hot and suffocating. Volcanic eruptions follow, and these often failing to give sufficient vent to the heated elements, the earth itself is convulsed. The ground heaves and swells like the waves of the sea, Great fissures appear, and sometimes cities, villages, and burning mountains are swallowed up. These wonderful manifestations will be more and more frequent and terrible just before the second coming of Christ and the end of the world as signs of its speedy destruction. The depths of the earth are the Lord's arsenal, whence were drawn weapons to be employed in the destruction of the old world. Waters gushing from the earth united with the waters from heaven to accomplish the work of desolation. Since the flood, fire as well as water has been God's agent to destroy very wicked cities. These judgments are sent that those who lightly regard God's law and trample upon His authority may be led to tremble before His power and to confess His just sovereignty. As men have beheld burning mountains pouring forth fire and flames and torrents of melted ore, drying up rivers, overwhelming populous cities, and everywhere spreading ruin and desolation, the stoutest heart has been filled with terror, and infidels and blasphemers have been constrained to acknowledge the infinite power of God. Said the prophets of old, referring to scenes like these, O oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence, as when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 to 3. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Nahum chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. More terrible manifestations than the world has ever yet beheld will be witnessed at the second advent of Christ. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? Nahum chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Bow thy heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Cast forth lightning, and scatter them. Shoot out thine arrows and destroy them. Psalm 144, verses 5 and 6. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Acts chapter 2, verse 19. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. Revelation chapter 16, verses 18, 20, and 21. As lightnings from heaven unite with the fire in the earth, the mountains will burn like a furnace, 
and will pour forth terrific streams of lava, overwhelming gardens and fields, villages and cities. Seething molten masses thrown into the rivers will cause the waters to boil, sending forth massive rocks with indescribable violence and scattering their broken fragments upon the land. Rivers will be dried up. The earth will be convulsed. Everywhere there will be dreadful earthquakes and eruptions. Thus God will destroy the wicked from off the earth. But the righteous will be preserved in the midst of these commotions, as Noah was preserved in the ark. God will be their refuge, and under his wings shall they trust. Says the psalmist, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. Psalm 91, verses 9 and 10. In the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. Psalm 27, verse 5. God's promise is, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. Psalm 91, verse 14.